Here we go. Awesome, awesome. Um, so we've combined the Monday and the, the Saturday group because my Monday teacher training is at seven and the Buddhist group was at six and I was literally having five minutes to eat my dinner, which was causing me immense heartburn. Um, <laughs> so I was like, that's not being kind to myself, you know? Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people on the Monday group aren't able to make it because the Saturday morning they've got other things on the go. So I'm hoping that they can just continue with the series um, via the catch up YouTube channels and uh, the sharing of the links. And I know that there are a lot of people quite surprises me because I get random text messages saying I've just watched session 14 and I'm confused and you know and I was like oh my gosh I didn't know anybody was watching so people are watching um which is great I'm really really happy to hear and of course your questions and your comments add to the to 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 the whole process as well because a lot of your questions then are questions that other people have in their minds so by you asking questions and your engagement really helps unpack that uh, the lighting in this room is not fantastic. I'm in a hotel room, um, and I hope my internet is okay. Uh, let's uh, let's get into let's go back to um, Tonglen. Uh, let's really immerse ourselves into the practice. And um, today we are going to do some Tonglen on someone that is a an acquaintance or a stranger um that you might not really know very well so it's someone that you have no uh connection to really but you know them okay there's no like i don't like you or i like you it's like just completely equanimous so we've we've done work on someone that's really close to us we've done work on someone that is that that is ourself uh we've done work on um someone that we don't like and now we now we're now we're choosing just a just a sort of random connection it might be the guy that works at the supermarket or someone that you see on the tube or someone that you know you often pass by working in the garden or whatever okay so we'll we, we just kind of uh identify who that person is and uh, we're going to work with them today mm. Let's take in three deep breaths, breathing in through the nose. Slowly breathing it out the nostrils with control. Breathing in again through the nose. Slowly breathing it out the nostrils. Last big breath in through the nose. Opening the mouth and gently sigh the breath out. Good. Coming to a natural breath. Making uh, clear in your mind who it is you would like to work with today. Imagine where they are. And as we increase the muscle of our empathy, we imagine their situation. We might not know their situation, but we can we can guess. Perhaps this is also a projection, but nonetheless. And we imagine ourselves to have a beautiful red rose at our heart center. And if you prefer lotus flower, that is also fine. And 
this is the symbol of your loving kindness and your wish to become an enlightened angel for the benefit of all beings. What we call your bodhicitta, your Buddha mind. And inside this flower is a sparkling blue diamond. It is large, it is flawless and magnificent and represents your wisdom mind. Indestructible, unshakable in the knowledge of where reality comes from. Your body transforms into a body of light, a blue light. You have no internal organs or bones or fluids. You are like a rainbow. And as you gaze at this person that you've chosen today, you see their problem, their potential problem, or a guest problem, whatever problem they have, we might not know, but it forms a thick black smoke and it moves towards their heart center. And we get in touch with our own breathing and we Inhale through our nose and every inhalation we draw their pain out of their body. It travels up to their face and leaves them through their nostrils and makes its way to a, a ball of swirling dark smoke in front of us. And it collects there. Spend a little while focusing on that. Now you've removed all of the darkness out of them. They are free from their problems. And you decide as a Buddha angel to destroy their darkness and their pain for good. The diamond in your flower sparkles. We're going to destroy the darkness by imagining it coming into the left nostril, moving directly to the diamond, and there will be a bright white explosion, and all of that darkness will be destroyed, and there'll be nothing left but intense light. So exhale nice and long. Now, let's breathe that in. Exhaling, and if you need to breathe it in again, just to make sure it's all gone, until there's nothing left.
dissolve the image of them and know that they are super happy and free today. You've done all you can for them. Wonderful practice for them. Slowly your rainbow body dissolves into the flower. Your loving kindness, your altruism, your wish to become a Buddha slowly dissolves into the diamond. Your wisdom mind, the mind of emptiness and of potentiality. And then that dissolves into clear space, luminous space. Taking in a slow, deep breath in and slowly breathing it out. And gently opening the eyes. Um, so we were talking about death and rebirth, um, according to the Tibetan book of the dead. Um, there is a wonderful read by, um, a Tibetan master by the name of Sogyal Rinpoche. Um, it was the first Buddhist book I ever read when I was living in London. And I remember being so enthralled by it, I couldn't put it down. Uh, it's called the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. Um, and he's got uh, beautiful centers in London. If you would like to visit uh, Donna, a um, place called the Rik Rikpa, Rikpa Center. If you're keen to visit, I do have a friend, a South African girl, um, Amelia, that you could always meet up with and go through with her. She's she's a really good friend. Um, she's a mom of four boys, so I, I think she'd, she'd be grateful to hook up and get out of the house. Uh, I love that. Thank you. Amazing. For sure. Uh, I'll send you if her. If you can send me her contact details, I, 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 would, I would enjoy that. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I will certainly do that. And she's a really, really awesome Dharma practitioner. She really is. Um, and she often visits the, the center and her practice is going really well. Um, and yeah. I do with some good influences. Since I started this class, all I think I ever feel nowadays is like I'm falling apart at the seams from every little being of my soul. So <laughs> I could do with someone who, who's, who's doing well with it. Absolutely. No, she's doing very well. And she had a drinking problem. She stopped drinking. Um, she's really transformed and changed her habits and in line with the Dharma. And she's really, really a very strong Buddhist practitioner in the Tibetan tradition, in the tradition in what we talk about. So it's really, really, it'll be a good meet, meet up. Maybe I'm not sure where she lives, but um, I'm hoping it's nearby. Anyway, I'll, 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 I'll hook the two of you up. Um, That'll be great. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, death. Um, I think Belinda brought up a really interesting question, you know, that that's been sitting with me. And uh, we, we I think we mentioned it a little bit last Saturday. And I'd just like to to reflect on it, Belinda. We had a we had a discussion. You said you, you've done a lot of work with um, with your clients and they have I guess their moms or their dads or an uncle or a granny or someone comes to fetch them. Is, is that right? Is that, is that more or less what, what you were talking about? Um, yeah. So I think none of the other people here know me. 
So, um, hello. I, um, I've been a psychic medium for 20 years. So I give people messages from their angels and their loved ones. And people often, after they have passed, they show their loved one that comes to me as a client. They show them their moment of passing, that they can show them how beautiful it was and who came to fetch them. So there's always somebody there to fetch them, usually the person that they miss the most, like a mother or a husband, father, granny. And then, of course, angels as well to support that process. So... Um, yeah, for me, it's diff difficult out of the Buddhism perspective to say that there's no soul because these people often show me um, that they will reincarnate back into the family. Or when somebody connects to a mother that has been passed for a couple of years, they also often show, but they did come back as a child or a grandchild. And then the people would usually already have felt that and it would just be a confirmation. And like I said to you, Mark, um, I also experienced that with my animals, that they reincarnate back into my life and you can actually, they've got the same habits. I sort of remember things like toys or, or, or things that they used to do and sort of just carry on where they left off. Wow. And for me, it's very difficult to understand that there's no soul and there, there's no planning in going forward into the next life. Mm. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to unpack this a little bit and if any of you would like to contribute you're more than welcome to. So, when we say there's no soul, um we don't mean that there's no awareness or consciousness that does not reincarnate. A soul is an unchanging thing that has a, a specific personality. So say, for example, you love eating ribs and steaks, and that's your soul. Your soul will always like ribs and steak. But then one day you decide to become a vegan, right? And we, I know lots and lots of meat eaters that have become vegans. So that now that means if, if one had a soul, that soul would have a personality. That, that soul would have, well, I'm a, this kind of person, and I like yoga, and... I will always be a medium every life and I will never have another job and I will always have the same thoughts and it's all it's almost like there's this permanently existing personality that we call soul okay so Buddhism rejects that idea um, and I think it's just semantics really because uh, Buddhism talks about a mind that continues from life to life your mind as it is now it's not that your soul is different to your mind or your awareness. It's the same thing. So in the Christian perspective, it's like, oh, my soul has gone to heaven. Well, it's your, it's, it, there's no difference between your consciousness, your awareness, and your soul. You could say your mind has gone to heaven or your mind has gone into the next life. Okay? So, so I think that's why B Buddhists say there's no soul because they want you to, 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 to realize that Whatever is going on in your life, whatever is going on in your mind, it doesn't disappear at the time of death. It doesn't become this other being or this other thing called a soul. So, so that's why it's really important because then if we get, if we understand that, we know, oh my gosh, then I have to do my meditation. I have to do my spiritual work because it's my mind that I'm taking with me into my next life. Not, not this other thing called a soul, which is free from all of that. Okay, it, and, and, and we can't get away from our awareness. I mean, a lot of people want to commit suicide, for example, but, but they don't understand that it doesn't just stop. I think um, it was Shakespeare, I'm trying to think of the, was it Hamlet or something where, where he says to be or not to be, that is the question, you know, um, and he was contemplating a suicide, but what happens if I, if I continue? What if I don't get away from it, you see? So in Buddhism, it says you can't do that. You can't just end it and it's finished and gone. The mind and everything associated with the mind, which is karma, will then move on. I hope that makes sense. Then, with regards to loved ones coming to visit us, how is it possible that mom or dad that has passed on and has reincarnated then 
then appears to us at the time of death. So I, there, there may be two there may be two reasons for that. Which which um, um, the one reason is that we exist in in different levels. Uh, so there's there's a higher being to us. There's an, there's already an enlightened Belinda, an enlightened Kerry. Okay, um, and that can appear perhaps two beings as because there's no time. I mean, if we look at quantum physics. Uh, we, we look at the Spider-Man movies now. There's all these different dimensions, you know, all these different realities they say that we exist in, um, which is quite fascinating, you know. Uh, Buddhism really doesn't go into that too much. The other, the other thing is it could be a projection from that dead person's mind to say, uh, you know, a Buddha could be coming to you as your mom, as your dad, as your uncle. Um, there was a wonderful movie with uh, Jodie Foster called Contact, where she meets an alien life and it's her dad, you know? Uh, and he says, look, I've taken on the form of your father, not to scare you, but 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 so that we can have a, a, a wonderful connection, you know? So it might not be the actual mind stream of mom and dad. It might appear to be that, uh, as a Buddha, or it could be a projection from the dead person's mind as they transgress, as they go through the bardo, that that would be something really wonderful to see. And they project that in the same way that you are projecting me and everybody else on this call. Because we have to always remember that Buddhism says that our reality is a projection coming from our karma. So if your karma allows, that would be a wonderful thing at the time of death that can help you move between lives okay but can but, i explain mm -hmm. sorry more yeah um what they've explained to me because obviously when i connect to someone who's passed over it's like you know i myself dive into that that consciousness that is the god energy so there's no separateness you actually just experience that immense peace mm -hmm. and love um, so what they've said is that, you know, you keep certain aspects. Yes, there's a higher self up there, and you can always connect to your higher self, well, up there. And then, um, you know, these, these aspects of you that, that have lived through different lives. So those aspects are still accessible, like in past life regressions and whatever, but it's all about what you need now. I agree with you. I always say that there's like a soul personality and an earthly personality. Mm. Because when you connect to the soul personality, it's, you know, there's certain things that you do in every life. If you are if you are a healer as a soul, you will always incarnate in some kind of, of healer role. Uh, but obviously, I mean, we can't know everything. We'll only know it if we get back there. Sure. But... It's like I explained to you last time as well that my daughter at the age of five knew things that my grandmother used to do and taught me things about my grandmother. Yeah. So always when I have a problem as to how to help my daughter with a certain mm. thing, I would ask the aspect of my grandmother to mm. mm. me because it's part of my daughter's higher self. Like you say, I agree that it's something that just feels a bit closer, something recognizable to me. So sure. my mind and my body can integrate. Okay, I'm connecting to Granny instead yep. of connecting to something that's indescribable or you know difficult yep. for us to imagine. Like a reference point for us. Yes. Because I think it is completely overwhelming uh, that experience. And um, but listen. I, I'm no authority. I'm just speculating um, what, and, and it's not clear to me in, in what I've studied as to, as to that particular, and I know this happens. I mean, I know from many accounts that people see loved ones at the time of death. My own friend had a near death experience. He said I was with him. I wasn't with him. I was at work, you know, so how could I be with him if I'm at work, right? Um, but he said, no, you were there and everybody was there. Like it, there was just no disconnection whatsoever um, in that moment of death. Um, the Tibetan Book of the Dead goes on to say that once we have that experience, 
then uh, we go through mm, a journey through the barrow of death um, and we hallucinate. We have a lot of hallucinations um, of angels, sometimes demons, um, which are all Buddha. They say they're all Buddha. They're all enlightened manifestations that we see, but sometimes they appear wrathful and sometimes they appear peaceful, but they're all part of Buddha mind. And they say, if you can, if you can maintain your awareness that this is all um, enlightened beings in front of you as a, all these images, then, then you can then you can be liberated at the time of death. Hi, Renee. How are you doing? Welcome. Hi, Mark. Thanks. Sorry, I'm late. I'm moving house. So, but here right. I am. <laughs> oh well, that's really cool. Welcome. Yeah, so, so then we go through this sort of uh, seven day cycle. And if you, if you are able to recognize in the death process that this is all just an illusion, that they are, uh, uh, what can I say, um, projections, then you can break the chain of rebirth and become a full Bodhisattva Buddha. But, but if you are overwhelmed at the, at the experience, you will try your best to, to, to escape it because it's too much and choose another body. And, and according to, the, um, to Robert Thurman's account of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, he says there are different lights that appear. And we often hear about the bright lights that we have to go to. This is the bright light of nirvana of of um end of your suffering but but the, the the apparently the mind when it encounters that bright light uh is overwhelmed and chooses one of the more softer sort of portals or lights and then those different colors represent different realms um so let's say we the the bright white light that we should go into at the time of death is too overwhelming for us because of our karma, we choose the light of the human realm. At that point, you, 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 you connect with a mom and a dad who are in union, okay? And you see them and you become, or, or whatever, and, and, or you decide maybe even if it's artificial insemination or something like that, but your mind gets attracted to that, and then you, your mind stream goes into that. And that is how we take on another life, uh, according to the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And, that, and, and so conception is at the moment that the sperm meets the egg. You know, the mind enters into that ovum the moment that happens, according to, to Buddhism. Yeah. Um, so, are there any comments or questions on that? And obviously, you know, it's quite a big thing when we talk about conception outside of the body, you know? Um, Donna? I actually just wanted to ask you something about the kind of thing. So, it's a bit off topic. So, if you want me to just shut up, I'm fine with that. You know, when, when I meditate, <clears throat> I... I, I always see green. So, so well, why is that? Why is it always green? Um, there are different colors within the, uh, uh, within Buddhism, there are five different Buddhas. And green is, is the color of the um, uh, Amoga City Buddha family. Now, with, okay. you know, that's something you can look into, perhaps. The green is a color of action, um, and it's an enlightened color. So there's, there's, there's blue, there's green, there's red, there's yellow, and there's white. And each color is a representation of a particular Buddha family. So, okay. for example, green Tara is, my, is, is a very, very holy uh, meditation practice. So she could be reaching out to you in, 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 her, green, in her greenness. But it means to take action. It, it means to take action. 
it's a it's a color for action and big accomplishments so green is green is associated with with quick action so perhaps perhaps green tara and maybe we should explore uh, a, a green tara meditation um for you that uh, that you could start connecting she she might be calling you okay thank you sorry i went off topic but it's, it's just been on my mind I, I it's a very interesting topic because yeah the colors are often different for me sometimes it's blue sometimes it's red and i've, I've often wondered like does everybody else get that <laughs> so yeah yeah, I, I, I don't. Um, so my practices are, are very visual where it is colorful, but it's a set sort of visualization that I have to do. Um, but if you are seeing different colors, I've heard I've heard of this uh, many, many times. People see colors in their meditations. Um, some teachers that are quite strict would say, don't worry about it. It's just a distraction. Focus on your, you know, focus on what on, on what you're supposed to be focusing on. But but I don't know. I'm I, I'd like to keep an open mind, and I'd like to think that those colors are different Buddha energies. For example, blue is intense, intense wisdom, sort of a cold wisdom, analytical wisdom. Uh, green is action, like quick fasting action. Red is the color of passion and love, loving kindness. Um, yellow is abundance um and equanimity and white is the color of um all-pervading wisdom um or or buddha mind sort of sort of clarity clarity white is the color of clarity so so you know the different colors have different sort of meanings if one studies the five buddha families they're called and each each buddha Represent, has their family. So within that Buddha color are all the deities that are, are of that color. And they all have a similar sort of energy in that color. They just have different forms and different aspects. And that is Tantra. That is uh, deep Tantra. And it's a part of Tantra that I have not studied. It's, it's, um, it's very vast. But I do understand it from a very high level point of view. um good so i think that wraps up death <laughs> unless there's any other <laughs> don't have to worry about that one anymore <laughs> the best thing that we can do at the time of death is tonglen okay now it's very hard to practice meditation as you're dying but if you are able to even before death or habituate your mind um, as you feel that you are dying with Tonglen, that is the most powerful practice to do. There are other practices which I have been initiated into. I can't teach them to you because they're secret. But one of the practices is to imagine your, your mind or your consciousness shooting out of your crown chakra into the heart of the Buddha you know, at the time of death. And this is called POA, transference of consciousness at the time of death. It is said that you must not touch a dead body, especially on their feet at the time, because they say that if the mind exits at the lower extremities, that could affect their rebirth and their and which realms they go to. If you ask, if you are going to touch them, you should touch their crown first um because if the mind leaves from the crown that's a good sign a lot of tibetan masters can tell where the mind has left from uh which is quite interesting sometimes when we did the power practice this is going to sound a bit odd but i i did see it is that there's an opening in your skull after the practice like a little hole in in the top of your head where the, where the Vajra master can actually put a straw into your head. It's the weirdest thing, but it, 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 I've seen it. Um, like there's an opening in your crown, you know, 
it's bizarre. It really is. And and uh, I've seen some strange stuff in India where when we did this power practice of people completely, their eyes roll back, they start shaking. You know, it's like being in a charismatic church or something. It's like the weirdest story, you know. Um, yeah, when, when, when they shoot their consciousness out of the top of their heads. But I would recommend... Uh, you know, Geshe Michael, who who I really see as as, as, as the authority, um, says, "Don't worry about power. You're never going to be able to do that at the time of your death. Just focus on Tonglen, which is I am dying, and I will I will take with me the darkness of the world in my death, and I will transform it into light. And it's what Jesus did, right? I am dying for for the sins of the world." I, I, I'm dying for the sins of the world. Let let me be the one, right? It's the same thing. I think he learned Tonglen somewhere along the line, because um, that's that that was the motivation, you know, to die. It really was. Um, interestingly enough, you know, the holy sacrament of Catholicism, where you drink the 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 blood and you eat the body of Christ. Like that is so tantric because Jesus is saying, here is my body. Here's the bread. This is my body. If you're going to eat this, you become me. Here's the wine. Here's my blood. Drink it. It's your blood. It's, it's my blood. It's your blood. You have the potential to be Jesus. You have the potential to be Christ energy. Eat it. Drink it. Take it. It's yours. You know what I mean? Like there it is. There's the call. Uh, but then obviously organized religion says, no, no, that's blasphemy. You can never become Jesus. You know, that's ridiculous, like ego talk. But Jesus said it, right? Here's my body. Eat it. What, what a strange thing to say, unless he really meant it. You know, this is, this is your birthright to become enlightened, to become a Christ in your own right. So... Uh, what I wanted to get into today is chakras, chakras, chakras. With Tonglen, we're working on the heart. And um, when we focus our energy on the heart, it starts to unravel and open. And the heart is the biggest knot where we experience the biggest blockage. So that's why Tonglen is, is, is why we're focusing on the, the rose or the, the lotus at our heart center with a diamond in it, okay? We are literally, as we focus on that area, we are, we are prana is gathering, life force is gathering in that particular region. Okay, so, I want to show you a little diagram. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let's see. Okay, there we go. Can you see? All right, super. So according to the ancient Indian um, yogis, They've had direct knowledge and experience with this inside their bodies. And reflexology and ancient Chinese meridian work and um, uh, Ayurveda and all of these ancient philosophies all have this system of understanding of channels, of uh, uh, knots, of blockages, etc., etc. They're all aligned, okay? Uh, right across Asia. So the belief is that you have a central channel, which is um, like a tube of light, called the Shashumna Nadi. Shashumna, you can see there. Now, if your life energy is flowing in the Shashumna Nadi, and I'll, I'll share this on the, on the group uh, WhatsApp, if, if the life force is flowing in the Shashumna Nadi, you will feel amazing. You will be happy. You will have thoughts of loving kindness. Um, and if you can keep the prana flowing in the Shashumna Nadi, 
you will experience a kundalini awakening i think uh, you may have heard that where um where the side channels loosen their grip on the shashumna nadi and the prana then flows beautifully and freely and then transforms your body into light okay the reason why we flesh bone and blood and the reason why it's hard to get out of bed in the morning and the reason why you have aches and pains and and also afflictive emotions is because of the pingala and the ida these are side channels in our being and um, my teacher calls them the evil sisters because um, well, the one is masculine and the one is feminine. So the pingala is a red color, like a like a pink. That's where that's where the English word pink comes from, uh, from Sanskrit. Pink pingala, okay. And ida, ida is a is a is like a blue channel, feminine. Pingala is masculine. In in the, it's also in Sanskrit called ha and ta. Ha is the pingala and ta is the ida. For those of you that have ever practiced hatha yoga, it means that that's what it means. Hatha yoga is is the ida and pingala yoga. It is also called the sun. Pingala is the sun and ida is the moon. Okay, so it could be called the yoga of sun and moon. Hatha yoga is the yoga of sun and moon. Pingala is associated with the emotions of irritability and anger. So when the prana in your body, when you feel anger or irritability or aversion or ill will, your prana moves into the pingala and not in the shashumna nadi. And then the pingala blows up, it puffs up like a balloon with that prana and as it puffs up it constricts and chokes the central channel it, it squeezes the central channel so imagine this is like a vine it, it it wraps around the central channel it's like a like a grapevine you know you see it growing on on a stick it, it kind of curls around the central channel and it's at those points those little orange points and you can see I mean isn't it interesting how the medical symbol of the snakes and the wings um, is taken from this isn't it interesting yeah you know the the with, with the wings it's fascinating and that is health right that is pure health pure health is when your prana is flowing less in the pingala and the ida and enlightenment is on its way right so the ida when you are feeling obsession craving me first okay you walk into a shop and there's a there's a the last donut and then little old lady is 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 kind of hobbling her way to towards the last donut but you push past her and 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 you buy that last donut knowing that she wants it okay like me first screw you then the prana goes into the ida i want i need right me first then the prana goes into the ida it puffs up and it squeezes the central channel where does it squeeze the central channel at what what we call the chakras it's what my teacher calls chokras. So I always think the, a lot of yoga studios these days, they talk about these chakras as if they're such wonderful things and, you know, they're beautiful and, you, and, and, and they draw pictures of them and, and all sorts of things, but they're not. These are the points where your life energy is being squeezed. Every time we have an afflictive thought of desire or anger, 
we are moving the prana out of the central channel and into the side channels and and that squeezes the, the squeezes it, they puff up and they constrict the central channel and then we get sick or we or we have what you know afrikaans i heard a new word a, a fleur moor which is like a temper tantrum <laughs> a fleur moor <laughs> i love that word a fleur moor yeah major constriction going on and then it turns into illness in the body because uh, there are many sub channels that that branch from each of these chakras thousands of um, uh, meridians you could call them as they say in chinese medicine meridians in 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 sanskrit they're called um grantis or uh, what's the other word mm. uh I can't think of it now. I've gone blank. All these little channels that run off. And those channels are, are, are attached to your body, to your heart, to your nervous system, to your... I mean, they are. Basically, your nervous system is made up of... is the physical form of these constrictions. If you look at your nose, there are two. Your eyes, you have two, right? Ears, you have two. Okay? This is because of the side channels. All right, we wouldn't have these things if the central channel was all we were working on. We would just be angels of light. There wouldn't be flesh. There'd just be, you know, light. If if all we could do was was move prana into the central channel, but because of these constrictions, we then age and we die. You know, you get a wrinkle. Oh, that's because my prana is not moving in the central channel. Oh, I hurt my back in yoga prana is not moving in the central channel okay we know that emotions cause pain in the body any healer will tell you that oh you got a stiff back you're dealing with uh, anger issues you got this issue oh it must be um i don't know you know each part of the body if you speak to a, a traditional healer they will tell you it's a certain type of emotion that's playing itself out cancer etc etc it's just blockages in the emotional body does this make sense? Okay, any questions from here? So the goal of our goal as Dharma practitioners is when we study loving kindness, when we practice Tonglen, we are forcing, we are rotor rootering from the inside. Okay? Our, our, and we are un blocking the channels we are opening the chakras from the inside rotor rooter you know if your if your pipes get blocked and the, the guys come and they push something down the pipe okay another way of clearing the pipes and you'll see a plumber do it is they'll take their wrench and they'll bang on the pipes maybe there's something i can do by knocking the pipe from the outside and you know what that is yoga Here's an ancient um, Tibetan, it looks pretty weird, they look like zombies, but this is, um, this, this depiction is probably 1,300 years old. It was found in, in, in ancient temples of people doing yoga, yogis and yoginis doing yoga and breath work, pranayama. Yoga, breath work and meditation all open the central channel. Kundalini yoga is all about opening the central channel. Tonglen. So I'll tell you an interesting story is when my teacher was going into a three year retreat um, in the Arizona desert, no talking for three years, no radio, no books, no phone for three years, right? Um, before we went, he was taught very secret, secret, tantric postures of movement before the retreat he went to new york he was looking at maybe thinking of doing some physical movement to incorporate as well went to a yoga class jiva mukti with david life and sharon gannon booked a class with them i mean renee you're a, a jiva mukti yogi aren't you yeah booked a class with them and thought oh my god 
this is the same stuff that my secret, secret teacher taught me. You know, Sharon and, and, and David are teaching me the secret stuff, but it's not so secret. Because everybody, you just pay 15 bucks and you get a yoga class and that's it. You got it. So my teacher went back to his Himalayan tantric master and said, listen, I'm sorry to tell you this, but the secret stuff that you taught me for my retreat is called like uh, Jiva Mukti Yoga and everyone's doing it. And the old master started crying. And then my teacher was like, oh, no, now I've really upset them, <laughs> you know. And, the, and, and he said, no, I'm sorry I upset you. And the Tibetan master said, no, I'm not upset. I'm, I'm, uh, these are tears of joy. I'm crying because it means that the people that are practicing yoga have karma for this secret, ancient, high practice, which is only given to the Brahmin priests and is secret. These people must be high realized beings that have come back at this time to continue their practice as the final stage of their light body activation. And then my teacher was like, no, 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 you don't understand. These people, they just want a tight ass. They, they just want to look good. You know, they, they're not interested in, in, in this stuff. He said, no, no, you don't understand. They are amnesiac yogis and yoginis. They, they will remember when their karmic seed cracks open, which is called Bhakchak Sempa, through understanding of the Dharma and through understanding of what yoga really is. Because yoga is an ancient technology of moving the prana into the central channel. And that's what it is. You do a left twist, you do a right twist, you're working on the idda and the pingala. All you're doing is shifting prana into the shashrimla nadi. Did you know that about yoga? Master Patanjali, who lived uh, 5,000 years ago, wrote the Yoga Sutras. And all the yogis think it's the best book ever, but it doesn't talk about yoga. It doesn't talk about physical asana at all. The book is about karma. The book is about emptiness. And then he says, oh yeah, and one way you can really prepare your body for meditation is to do some yoga. And, and Patanjali says all that yoga is for is to make the body strong to Rotoruta so that you can sit and go deeply into focus and um, purification and accumulation. Now, very cool, but why not combine them both? Why not meditate and do yoga together so that you're banging on the pipes and Rotorutaing at the same time? Okay, and that's that's kind of where Geshe Michael was when he was in his three year retreat. All of a sudden, all the the Diamond Mountain Buddhists started practicing yoga, and I was like, at that time, I think it was two thousand and three. I was like, what? We got to do yoga, but yoga's for girls, man. I don't want to do yoga. This is ridiculous, you know. And then I did yoga, and I was like, geez, this is hectic. Like, this is not for girls. This is tough, man. You know, um, and I love yoga. And, and, and when you finish a yoga class, you will feel good. You will feel energized. You will feel happier. Why? Because you managed to put some prana into your central channel and move it out of the idda and the pingala. And Mark, I just wanted to ask on, on yoga, and I mean, a friend of mine who's been studying as an instructor in yoga nidra and all sorts for for you know a couple of decades um you know talks about actually uh you know her number is um 26 sun salutations a day is okay. like if if that's all you do in terms of your yoga practice it's like that's that's the perfect kind of but i wonder like Gisha Michael, in terms of his movements, I presume was going further than the, than the sun salutations. Yes, absolutely. So, Renee, there is a practice that they found in 
in an ancient monastery, the practice goes back to 1,200 years ago, and it's a practice uh, that um, a female yogini uh, had recorded. Her name is Naguma, and she was the partner of a, of, of a very famous Buddhist yog, 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 um, yogi called Naropa. And there are certain asanas for each chakra. And I, I'd love to I'd love to take you through that. So maybe maybe we can do a yoga class together. Does everyone here do yoga? Yeah? Okay. Donna also? Sort of? <laughs> well we can try it, okay? We can try it. My yoga practice is really sucks at the moment. I've I've really let myself go. Um, but I've, I'm starting to get back into my body, which has been great. I've been going to gym, exercising. It's really lifted my my depression and my mood. Um, but yoga is, is outstanding. Yoga is outstanding. And my Molus used to teach Naguma. We used to teach it together at all the yoga studios. The the yoga of Lady Naguma. So there's a sequence, and there's a there's breath work, and there's um, what you call uh, constrictions, right? Um, sure, I'm forgetting all the Sanskrit words. The nadis, the nadis, the nadis are the channels. That's the word that's just come back to me. There are holes and bars, right, within the practice. Um, and it's quite an interesting practice. And it is really, really very similar to Jiva Mukti. The flow is very similar, but the yogis always don't like me saying it, but yoga can be taught in a wrong way, where it, where it confuses the prana in the body. And I think 95% of the yoga classes that you pay money for are unfortunately not being taught in the right sequence. And, and I'd just like to say for, for those in the class who, who don't, um, you don't have to be overly flexible at all. Like I'm I'm never going to be able to do a number of the poses. Um, and, and it's not about that. Um, and that's the great thing. And if, if any of you are in Johannesburg, uh, living yoga uh, with Sarah is just exceptional. And, you know, uh, no mark supports Sarah and, and yeah. I'm not advertising, but it really is yeah the best place to go if you, you can. Oh, absolutely, hundred percent, Donna. So if I was to Google <clears throat> this a yoga class that I could do online, what would I Google? So you know, that I don't go get one of the wrong ones. Yeah. What, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reach out to Marlis and ask her because I know we filmed um, we filmed her doing uh, the Naguma sequence. Okay. Um, so I can always share that with you. Yeah, that would be great because it's something I've, 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 uh, you know, I keep meaning to do. Like I keep meaning to go to gym on Monday, and it never quite happens. So yeah. if I do it, I'd like to do it properly and know that it's been done for a purpose. You know, absolutely. My, my motivation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll reach out to her and ask her if she's got the that video, Andrea. Thank you. Andrea? Sorry, I was just trying to find the unmute button. <laughs> um, where is Living Yoga based? I actually, it's funny because I actually Googled um, yesterday. I was looking, I want to just get back into my fitness and I just was looking for a yoga studio and I had exactly the same thought. I was like, how do I know yeah. which one to pick? Y you know what I mean? Like, is it all marketing? Like, who's doing it the correct way? So, yeah. Living Yoga. Living Yoga. Also, um, wonderful yoga studio called Ishta Yoga in Athol. There's a wonderful yoga teacher there, Wendy uh, and Angela. They also hold a beautiful space. So yeah, there are authentic studios, uh, you, but there's also a lot of studios that are very mixed with New Age. So, um, and, and a lot of what they're teaching is really corrupted, um, unfortunately. There's been a lot of influence and wrong information, um, which can be quite quite disturbing to me. You know, I've been to a couple of classes at some studios that I've been like, oh my God, this is awful. And people are loving it. But, you know, again, it's a karmic thing. So your karma will resonate. You'll hear living yoga and you'll go, oh, cool. 
you know, I resonate with this pe- with this studio. Other people will be like, nah, I want to do like Buddha Con or I want to do beer yoga or something else, you know, goat yoga or what are these other things that are going on? <laughs> okay. Um, I think we end class. Um, yeah. I just want to ask. So I'm a Kundalini teacher. So is Kundalini in line with the correct teaching? I believe so, Belinda. I believe Kundalini is extremely powerful because you're working on the chakra system. And if you, yeah, really, really, really uh, very powerful. The moves, I've never done a Kundalini class, but what I hear is is that it's very authentic. Um, I can't really say too much because I've never really done it. Um, but but I think, I think, you know, Shivananda Yoga is also an incredible lineage. There's a studio in uh, Melville, I believe, very authentic, also done correctly. So I think it's important to, 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 um, to try and trace the lineage. Where does this come from? Who are the teachers? Who are their teachers? You know, where does it, does it go back to ancient India? Or, and if your teacher can tell you where and how it comes from, that's better. Rather than, yeah, no, it's just, it's just my own thing that I do, you know, then, then it's kind of like for me a bit suspect. All the Kundalini yoga is actually comes from Yogi Bhajan, Bhajan. that brought it from India. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's, and they pr- try to keep it as authentic. Authentic. As possible. Absolutely. Authentic. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, um, to understand that, at some stage, an enlightened being taught yoga classes, right? And then who would you rather go to? Like an enlightened being who's teaching yoga or somebody that just kind of made up their own flow sequence? Maybe they're channeling, you know, I suppose I can't judge either because, you know, but there's a chance. Like, are they channeling or are they just taking a wild guess? Or And that's why I always sort of go back to the lineage, where does it come from? It's been it's been practiced by thousands of people, if not hundreds of thousands of people, and they've had good results. Okay, fine. Then then I'm happy to follow that. You know, then I then I'm not taking chances with what's left of my life because I've only got another couple of years to do yoga until my body starts to pack up. You know what I mean? So um, I don't have much time. I got to practice the real, the real deal, the diamonds, and not the costume jewelry. Yeah. Anyway, I think that's it for today. Um, maybe what we can do is explore next week who Lady Naguma was, and it's so cool because I'm so tired of hearing about all the famous men in religious history that it's really exciting to explore who the women were and to and to sort of dig them up in a way, you know, and say. Let's honor Lady Naguma. Let's honor the divine feminine that has always been around, but has always been put down by the, by the dominant male. Because the, the history books were written by males. Makes me, makes me, uh, it doesn't make me proud to be a man, to see how, you know, what they've done in the world um, and how, you know, they've suppressed the, the feminine. But times have changed and women are, in many ways have taken over look at you guys i mean everyone here is a woman where are the where are the men you know uh the, what are they getting ready for the rugby game like like you you guys are the keepers of wisdom now you know the, the men are they're sleeping unfortunately not all men but the this is a problem why, why are the women waking up you know they call it the age of aquarius where the women take charge, where the women, you know, you look at movies, all the movies, are, all the heroes are women. I mean, I, I saw um, Flash and, and Superman is now Superwoman, you know, and um, the Jedis and Star Wars are now women, right? And, and, and it's like the whole thing has shifted and it's, it's, it's undeniable. Look at Putin and all the shit that's going on now. Complete mess created by these men, you know, they, they don't know their ass from their elbow. And they're not, they're not leading with wisdom and, and loving kindness. So please, ladies, take charge and uh, continue pushing forward. It's about time. Okay. We'll see you next Saturday. Uh, let's do a dedication. 
May I attain enlightenment by attending this class. May this wonderful karma that I've accumulated by, by being here, may it expand, may it increase. May all beings be happy. May all beings have health. May all beings be safe. May all beings live in peace. And may I be the one to help them. Gewadi kewokun Tsunami eshe zozoshin Tsunami eshe lejunwe Tampa kunye topa shok Thank you ladies. Namaste. Have a beautiful weekend. And we'll see you. I'm going on a, I'm going on a shamanic journey on Friday night. So I'm not sure if I'm going to be in a in a position to teach on Saturday morning. I'll have to let you know closer to the time. <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. Um, psychedelic mushrooms. I have to fast and everything. So that's another story. I'm keeping an open mind, right? Yeah. Okay. I'll let you know. Let us know what it's like, Mark. I'm very okay. interested to know. I will let you know. I'm doing a one on one and they're taking me somewhere in Michalisburg and it's a whole night over and all of this. So I'm not sure. Who, who, who are you doing it with? Um, with a shaman called Michael. Okay. Uh, I can't remember his surname. I've been going to him. He's really, he's really good. Okay. Um, and he's a, he's a powerful meditator. So he'll do like, 20 days of Vipassana where he sits and doesn't move for three hours at a time and then locks himself in a dark room for five days with no light and like he's a really hardcore meditator so I really appreciate it, that about him he, he's got a keen understanding of Buddhism um, which I resonate with and he, he, he calls me out on my shit time and time again so yeah I really appreciate that approach um, you know as a, for therapy that's definitely my style uh, Enjoy it. Thank you. I will. So I'll let you guys know. Thank you very much. Um, have a good weekend and we'll hopefully see you next week. Bye now. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everyone.